Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 21. We're, we're kind of taking a detour today from uh, our series. We're in a series in 1 Corinthians that we're calling Scandalous Church. Well, today being Palm Sunday, we're going to detour from that, and we're going to talk about the events that took place there on that very first Palm Sunday in the city of Jerusalem. You might remember it was just uh, almost two years ago on June 24th, 2013, that the Miami Heat had a parade down Biscayne Boulevard. Anybody, anybody here at that parade? Some of the folks were at that parade as the Miami Heat paraded down Biscayne Boulevard. They say that it was one of the largest parades that the city of Miami has ever had. Some 400,000 people lined the streets of Biscayne Boulevard. There in a double-decker bus was uh, LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and uh, Chris Bosh and the entire team as, as they traveled down uh, that boulevard and the crowds cheered and celebrated together our third world championship. Shane Battier was there blowing kisses. Dwayne Wade was holding up three for his third uh, world championship. And Chris Anderson, as only Chris Anderson could, was flopping his wings as the Birdman. If you're a Miami Heat fan, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, then you need to watch the Miami Heat, and I would encourage you to uh, do so. Uh, that was quite a parade, quite a parade. Today's passage, the passage of scripture that we're looking at this morning, also talks about a parade. Now, it's not a parade in a traditional sense with marching bands and floats and clowns and animals or even a double-decker bus or sports heroes waving to the crowd. Even though I say that, there were animals in this processional. And there was a grand marshal in the parade that takes place in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. Of course, the grand marshal was none other than Jesus Christ himself. And so let me encourage you to sit back this morning and enjoy with me the Jerusalem Passover week parade as we study it in our text today. And so we're in Matthew chapter 21. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to follow along. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll put it up on the screen and you can follow along with me. We're gonna begin in verses six through nine and then we'll study just a little bit of a larger passage. Matthew chapter 21, verse six. It says this, and the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and Jesus sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks or their, their coats on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, just as the boys and girls shouted and just as we sang just a few moments ago, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Would you pray with me one more time today? Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would enable us to understand what was taking place on this very special day more than 2,000 years ago. But Lord, help us not only to understand the events of this day and the significance of the parade and all of the cool things that took place. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize the significance for us. What, what these events mean for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to examine our worship today. May our worship not just be empty words that we cry out that are not backed up by uh, the actions and attitudes of our life. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly recognize you as the Messiah, to truly recognize you as King, to truly recognize you as Lord of Lords as you are. So challenge us from your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Last year, this time, we were walking through the book of Luke, if you'll remember, and we made the statement that the events that occurred on this day, the events of this passage, conclude Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Today, we're in Matthew chapter 1, but if we took the time, and we won't take the time, we could go all the way back to Matthew chapter 16, and we would see that this journey that Jesus took walking towards Jerusalem that culminates in the verses that we're looking at today actually began, as I mentioned, back in chapter 16. Matthew 16 and verse 21 says this, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and the third day be raised again. The second thing, if you're following along in your notes by way of introduction, is this. The events of this passage transpire during the Feast of Passover, which was one of Israel's most important holidays. If you uh, come from a Jewish background or you know anybody that, that is from a Jewish background, I'm sure you've heard and you understand the significance of the Passover for the Jewish people. The Passover was the holiday that celebrated Israel's rescue from Egyptian bondage. You remember the story. Remember how that God sent an angel to kill the firstborn of every Egyptian household. But God spared the families of the Israelites because they had painted the doorpost of their home red with lamb's blood. The angel of death literally passed by those houses that had blood over the doorpost, thus calling that holiday the Passover. Now, for hundreds of years, the Jews have celebrated and commemorated the fact that God protected them from the Egyptians. And so on this day in Jerusalem, as Jesus made his way into the city of Jerusalem, thousands of people were there in the city during this holy week, during Passover week. Historians tell us that the city of Jerusalem swelled to almost 200,000 people during Passover week. And they tell us that more than 200,000 lambs were sacrificed. The other thing that I want you to catch as we walk through the passage today, and this is where it becomes a little bit more personal, but the other thing is this. The passage, this passage of Scripture demonstrates the power of sincere worship. Let me say that again. This passage demonstrates the power of sincere worship. You see, when believers sincerely recognize and honor Jesus Christ, it causes the world to stand up and to take notice. We see that here in the passage as Jesus' disciples and Jesus' followers sincerely and passionately and yes, even publicly worshipped him. As we'll see at the end of the passage, it caused individuals who were not followers of Jesus to stand up and take notice who is this man what is the significance of this day and it allowed the followers of Jesus to point even those unbelievers towards him we'll see that clearly articulated in the verses that we're looking at this morning so go back with me to the beginning of the chapter and let's begin in the beginning of the chapter and tell the story chapter 21 and verse 1 it says this now when they speaking of Jesus and his disciples drew near to Jerusalem And came to Bethphage, which was just a small town on the Mount of Olives, that Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village in front of you, and find, and there you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie both of them, and bring them to me. And then Jesus gives further instructions. He says, and by the way, if anyone says anything to you, if anyone protests and says, hey, how come you're stealing my donkey? Then you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying in verse 5, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. 
Just several things that I want you to catch today, and I know our time is short because of everything that's happened in the program, but if you're following along in your notes, the first thing that we see is this, this entry of Jesus, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem perfectly fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. You see, Jesus arriving on this day in the city of Jerusalem was not random, nor was it happenstance. He didn't arrive early, and, and he didn't arrive unexpected. Jesus was very punctual. He arrived right on time. Let me give you two verses that, that, that you can study later on. First of all, the timing of his arrival perfectly matches with the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. You see, the prophet Daniel, hundreds of years earlier, had been given by God a certain calendar of time which was marked off precisely to determine the date when the Messiah would present himself to the nation of Israel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25 says this, now listen and understand, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to, be, to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Now you sit back and read that and you and I read that and it's hard for us to, to put the pieces of that puzzle together. But here is what Daniel is prophesying and here is what take pl takes place as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem that day. Uh, according to the reckoning of Sir Robert Anderson, former head of Scotland Yard, and an English believer with a great knowledge of the Bible, he says the precise date on which Daniel's prophecy was to be fulfilled was this day. The day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Jesus came to Jerusalem the exact day that Daniel had predicted some 530 years ago earlier. And so when Jesus came into the city, and he actually makes the statement in another passage, he says, and Jerusalem, this is your day. Jesus was realizing that he was perfectly fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. We see a second thing, the circumstances of this arrival, of Jesus' arrival, perfectly match with the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. In verse 9. So, for, so first of all, his arrival fulfills Daniel chapter 9. It also fulfills the prophecy found in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Now, now we're going to read Zechariah 9 in just a second, but, but remember with me what is transpiring in our passage. Jesus approaches the city of Jerusalem. He sends two unnamed disciples. He doesn't tell us which disciples they were, whether they were James or John or Philip or Bartholomew. He doesn't tell us which one. He sends two unnamed disciples ahead, and he tells them, I want you to look for a young donkey, a young donkey with its mother. Untie them and bring them to me. And Jesus said, oh, by the way, if somebody stops you, if there's a guy that says, hey, what are you doing stealing my donkey? Jesus said, you just tell them the Lord needs it. So these two disciples take on this mission, this, you know, um, this search for the donkey. And sure enough, just as Jesus tells them, in the spot where Jesus tells them, they find a colt and a mother donkey, and Jesus unties them. And as they're untying them, everything transpires exactly like Jesus was saying. And the disciples look at the man and say, simply, the Lord needs it. And I have no idea how the man responded, but the text indicates that the man allowed them to take the donkey. Now, you and I sit back and think, that's a cool story. I mean, Jesus knew that. He told them exactly what was going to take place, and they did it, and it all transpired exactly like Jesus said. That's a cool story, but it's more than that when you compare it with Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Because Zechariah 9, 9 says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey riding on a donkey's colt. What do we find? We find that this arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem perfectly fulfilled prophecy. The next thing that's in your outline is this. Jesus once again demonstrates 
that he alone is the Messiah. He demonstrated two things, and we've already alluded to it, so I'll just kind of give it to you quickly. Jesus demonstrated, um, or he gives us a great example of the omniscience of Jesus. Jesus knew exactly where the donkey was going to be. He knew exactly what the man was going to say. Jesus demonstrates his omniscience, the fact that he knows all things. But we also see here a tremendous example of the sovereignty of Jesus. The fact that he is in control. I, I, I'm not a country guy. Uh, you guys know this. If you've been, been around me long, I think I've ridden the horse two or three times in my entire life. I don't have a great desire to ride a horse again. Um, I, I have to confess, I've never ridden a donkey before. I'm not sure you could pay me enough money to get on a donkey. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert of that, but the, there's something really significant in the passage. It says that this colt that they were bringing to Jesus had never been ridden before. Well, what does that mean? That this was an unbroken colt, all right? I mean, when a, when a, when a rider gets on a colt for the very first time, what does that colt do? It begins to buck and kick. You say, Brian, how do you know that? I've watched plenty of cowboy movies. I know what happens when you get on a, an, an unbroken colt, all right? I got plenty of experience in all of that. So here's what takes place. Jesus sits on this unbroken colt. And how does the colt respond? Doesn't buck him off. There's no resistance. Usually a colt would have been broken before it was ridden. Not this one. Not with Jesus. Jesus gets on the colt, and the colt realizes that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is seated on his back and he transports the very creator of the universe through the streets of Jerusalem. What do we see today? We see the omniscience and the sovereignty of Jesus. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem perfectly fulfills prophecy. Let me show you a second thing. Jesus' entry in Jerusalem prompted spontaneous praise. We read verses 6 through 9. I won't take the time to read them again, but as, as Jesus rode through the city, people took off their coats and their cloaks, and they laid them on the ground. And as the boys and girls illustrated, they laid down palm branches as well. That's why this is called Palm Sunday. They laid down palm branches. And then as Jesus rode through the city, the crowd broke out into spontaneous praise. Now, you know as well as I do that, that the reception that Jesus received was abnormal. Um, obviously, every visitor to the city of Jerusalem was not received with such fanfare. But as Jesus rode through the city of Jerusalem, the crowds, at least some of the crowds, recognized him as the Messiah, recognized him as the conquering king. And as Jesus rode through your outline, say that the gathering crowds welcomed Jesus as a conquering king. Let me pause for a second and let's kind of flesh that out for just a second. Uh, normally a conquering king would ride through on a, on a white stallion and normally a conquering king would come through in unbelievable splendor. Not Jesus though. Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem was completely different. Jesus didn't come in wealth. Jesus came in poverty. Jesus didn't come and present himself in grandeur, but Jesus presented himself in meekness. Jesus didn't come to slay Israel's enemies. Jesus came to save mankind. He didn't come to conquer Rome, even though the disciples hoped that that's why he came. He didn't come to conquer Rome. No, Jesus came to conquer sin and death. And Jesus didn't come to be crowned, at least at that moment. Jesus came for the purpose of being crucified. And although the crowds received him as their conquering king, it was not coronation day yet for Jesus. Coronation day is coming, but that was not coronation day for Jesus. It wasn't a throne that was immediately before him. 
It was a cross. The crowds welcomed him, though, as conquering king. The next thing that I wrote in my notes, if you're following along, is this, that the gathering crowds welcomed Jesus with a psalm of praise. They cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The song that is sung is from the Hallel. That might not mean anything to you. That simply is um, the psalms that are joined together from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. You say, Brian, what was the Hallel? The Hallel was the song that, that the pilgrims would sing as they made their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. They knew it by heart, and, and they would sing those psalms of praise as they traveled to the city of Jerusalem. And as Jesus entered into the city, they began to lift up their voices and they sang those psalms, not just any psalms, but messianic psalms that were recognizing Jesus for who he was. You see, the song that was sung acknowledges Jesus as the son of David, which is a messianic title. Notice verse 9. I'll read it again. And the crowds that went before him and followed after him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The name or the term Hosanna means very simply, Lord, save us now. And so there on the streets of Jerusalem, there was a spontaneous worship service as Jesus made his way through the streets of Jerusalem. It's interesting, Matthew doesn't allude to it, Luke does. Vicki mentioned it just a few moments ago because the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders stood in the background and the religious leaders were indignant and they were upset. Why, why in the world are these people crying out? Why are these people attributing messianic titles to Jesus? Why are they praising him? And Jesus makes the statement. He says, you know what? It doesn't matter whether they sing or not. Because if they don't sing, even the rocks would cry out in worshiping, worshiping him. There was a spontaneous worship service. Let me ask you this morning, can we kind of personalize it for just a second? Let me ask you this morning, when was the last time that your interaction with the Messiah prompted spontaneous praise? Maybe in your life you realized who he was. Or maybe in your life you recognized what he had done in your life. Maybe, maybe you experienced his power in your life. Maybe you experienced his presence in your life. But God did something in your life that prompted you to spontaneously praise Thank you. <laughs> he is worthy of our praise. Now listen, this was a little bit of a fickle crowd because we find them praising him on this day. And most historians believe at least some of them that were praising him on this day were some of the ones that were crying out to crucify him just a few days Jesus' entry in Jerusalem prompted spontaneous praise. Let, let me show you one other thing in the passage today. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem provoked curiosity. Would you read verses 10 and 11 with me? It says, and when he entered into Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? Not everybody knew who Jesus was. He had, he had performed some miracles and, and, and there were people around who had followed him, but certainly not all of the 200,000 people in the city were aware of who he was and had come to worship him. And so as some of the people who were there for Passover and some of the residents of Jerusalem saw, saw what was taking place down that, that main drag, it caused them to question, who is this and the crowd said 
the crowds responded, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. I not only love the reaction of Jesus' followers as they praise him, but I'm challenged today by the response of the rest of the city. As I mentioned in the beginning of the message, and notice that the sincere praise of Jesus' followers provoked interest in the minds and the hearts of the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem. Not only did it provoke interest, but it provoked curiosity as well. So much so as that as they observed what was taking place, they began to question, who is this? Let me pause today and and let's personalize this for us as we can as we begin this, this, this holy week, as we begin this, this week in which we are moving towards Good Friday and we're moving towards Easter Sunday a week from today. Catch this, church, catch this. Sincere and passionate worship causes unbelievers to ask questions about Jesus. Let me say that again. Sincere and passionate worship causes unbelievers to ask questions about Jesus. Sometimes, sometimes we feel like it's our job to debate the principles of Christianity. And we sit back and we see somebody who doesn't have the right answers or, or who is following the wrong person or who is living the wrong way. And if we're not careful, we feel like it's our job to criticize them, condemn them, correct them, or change their theology. And I found, I found very few people who came to Christ because someone debated them and won the debates. But you know what causes people to ask questions about Jesus? Sincerity, passion, transparency, sincere belief, sincere worship. We see that taking place here. As the crowds worshiped Jesus, it caused the others to say, who is this? On Thursday, Jose and I went out to lunch with uh, Tom and Rene Border, our missionaries to Japan, and, and Tom made a statement that stuck with me. I, I, I hope I interpreted it correctly, but he, he made a statement that, that stuck with me. It hit home with me. He was speaking about the difficulty of reaching Japanese people, or Japanese men specifically for Jesus Christ. And he said for years he tried to answer questions that they had not asked. I mean, for years he thought it was his job to try to convince them if they had questions. Here's the answer to your questions. And for years he tried to answer questions that they did not ask. The simple truth is this, church. We cannot make a person believe. It doesn't matter if we dot all of our I's and we cross all of our T's and we know the answer to every single question. We cannot make them believe. It is not our job to convince them. It's our job to create a thirst in their lives. It's our job to create curiosity in their life. It's our job for us to live in such a way that they see something different in us. Man, you're going through that trial, but you still have a smile on your face. How is that? How are you able to have a smile on your face while you're going through that trial? Man, you just lost your job, but, but you're not mad at the employer. How are you able to maintain that attitude with everything that's happened to you? You see, they sit back and they observe our worship. They observe the way we live. They observe the way that we act and react in our attitudes. And it causes curiosity in their life. 
I just heard one of our men was talking about someone that he had invited the church not long ago and God is beginning to change this man's life so much that this man's mom has come to the man in our church and said, you know what, I don't know what's happening in his life, but I want what he has. That's what was taking place here in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, they saw sincere, passionate worship, and it caused people to say, who is this? I don't know whether I understand it, but there's something that I want there. Let me ask you today, does your life, does your worship create a thirst? Does your life, does your worship create a curiosity in the lives of others that do not know Jesus? The last thing that I'll say is this. We see it in the passage. Sincere and passionate worship points people to Jesus. Notice verse 11. Verse 10, who is this? What a great opportunity for a response. Verse 11, why? This is the prophet Jesus who came from Nazareth. What a great opportunity to point people to Jesus. As a result of their questioning, they were able to tell others about Jesus Christ. I read that and think, wow, what what a powerful opportunity. What a challenge for each and every one of us this week and every week of our lives. So, So church, can I ask you today, Has this ever happened to you? You're living in such a way. Your life is different than the people around you. Your attitude is different than the coworkers with whom you work. Your attitude is different than the other bosses in your company. You treat those underneath your leadership differently. You treat your family members different than anybody else because you have the love of Jesus Christ in you. You have the worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in you. And as a result, it piques curiosity in the lives of others. I'm afraid, church, that at times we've become very good at defending our faith, but we're not real good at living it. And may God help us to live our... And by the way, I want us to be able to defend our faith. But but may we learn to live our faith before we learn to defend it. In Spanish, or at least in Mexico, we had the saying, Escribes con la mano, borras con el codo. The idea was we would write something or say something with our lives, but our elbow is erasing what we're saying. And I'm afraid at times we publicly say what we believe, but our attitudes, our actions, our lack of praise erases what we say. May God help us this week to live in such a way that it creates curiosity, interest, and thirst in the lives of others. Let me ask you one other question today. Two questions, actually. Is Jesus your Savior? By that I mean, have... uh, Has there been a moment in your life when you realize that he's more than just Jesus the prophet, that he didn't come just to wear a crown, but he came to die on a cross? And there was a time in your life when you realized, hey, you know what? I need Jesus. I cannot make it on my own. I need him. And you, by faith, trusted in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You asked him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart and to be your personal savior. Has there ever been a time in your life that that's transpired? If not, I got good news for you. Right now, Jesus stands with his arms wide open and he is willing and open and ready to receive you. And right where you are, you can pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And by faith, I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior and to save me from myself and from my sin. If you'll do that, God will do a work of grace in your life 
and begin to transform you? Have you recognized him as your savior? If you have, have you recognized him as your king? Is he your king? Not just on Easter Sunday, not just on Palm Sunday. Is he king of your life? Does he sit on the throne of your hearts? And do you, with your actions and attitudes, truly honor and worship and venerate him, giving him the praise that only he is due? This is a great week for us to examine our relationship with the Lord. I'd encourage you to take your Bibles this week and begin in Matthew chapter 16 and read through the rest of the gospel. And, and read not only what Jesus did, but try your best to personalize that. What did he do for me? And let me challenge you this week to live in such a way that you point people to Jesus. As their curiosity is piqued, may you be able to look at them and say, listen, it's not me, it's Jesus in me. That's the change. 